evening, everyone. Welcome to Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship. I am looking for something. Hold on just one minute, if you don't mind. And we are going to look at Ecclesiastics 3. If you want to turn your Bible there, that's going to be the op opening um, scripture. Ecclesiastics, what did I say? Ecclesiastes, I'm getting corrected here. I, you know, I'm really bad with the English language, believe it or not. I can, I, I can take words and pronounce them a hundred different ways. But anyway, good morning, good morning, good morning. And um, I want to open with this passage. Um, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born. A time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Hallelujah, Lord. In this, uh, in, in this service, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will join in the words that are spoken today. In fact, that they would be inspired by you, Lord, and directed by you, Lord. And may you point the way for all of us. May we take what's ever said today and apply it to our life, lives. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Well, notice in that um, passage I just read, there's a lot of times for different things. And I heard a preacher speaking the other day, um, Dr. Georgia Hill, and she was saying that she believed that, it, that COVID could be viewed as a time for us to get close to God. And I, I totally 100% agree with her. If you notice on there, it says um, a time um, to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing. We right now are in an hour where God, I believe, is trying to get our attention. You know, I don't necessarily believe he was the cause of COVID, but in this time, I believe he is speaking loudly to us and saying I've taken away all your distractions, or at least tried to. I've taken away things that um, pull you away from me, like going out to dinner with friends, or going to the movies, or going out to lunch with girlfriends, or doing whatever, or getting with family gatherings over the holidays. I am taking you away from all those things that cause you um, distractions. And I'm placing you in a place where you can seek my face daily. You can seek my righteousness. You can seek me and wait upon me. Wait upon me. I believe that if we don't take advantage of this particular time in our life, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. And I, and I want to say this, that... People that really know God are people that walk with God, talk to God, pray to God, worship God, and read the Word. They read the Word. Everything they do and say is based on the Word of God. So if you want to be one of those people, you need to walk with Him. You need to read the Word with Him. You need to worship him. You need to pray to him. You need to do all those things. It's not an accident that my husband knows so many things in the word of God. He reads and studies 
and I'm here to witness it hours and hours and hours, hours and hours daily. Now, it's no coincidence that he knows God and God knows him. So I want us just to look at a few scriptures. You know, today's uh, Psalm is Psalm 41, and I read it over, and um, it really exhorts people to care about the poor. And I think that's so important, not just in this time, this season, but all year. And I was thinking to myself that um, it would be nice if we committed every month to giving money or taking groceries and dropping it on someone's porch un unannounced even, surprising them with blessings. Because there's those of us in the body that have so much, really, we have so much. So to bless others, you know, Jesus didn't ask us to just give what we could. He said, give till it hurts. You know, he if someone asks for one coat, give him two. What do you mean two? Why, why should I give him two? Isn't one enough? And we hear that chatter in the earth about people complaining about the poor. You know what? I have students that are poor, and they try to get things together. They try to make things work, and it's almost impossible. Everything is working against them, and we need to keep that in mind. They're not poor because they want to be poor. I do not believe that. But waiting on the Lord is what I want to, what I really want us to concentrate on. Because during this time, when we are in isolation, during this time when we are alone for the most part, God wants us to wait on Him. And if you look, look to Psalm 40, the Psalm before, Psalm 41. It says, the first verse, should have had it marked, but I didn't. That's okay. Here we go. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me. How many of us are doing that? We pray, we say, mm, nothing happened. I waited patiently for the Lord. I waited patiently for him. And he inclined to me. And he heard my cry. And he also brought me up out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay. And he set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear. And we'll trust in the Lord. Hallelujah. During this time, we feel like we're in miry, my, 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 blah, miry clay. We feel like we're sinking. We feel like, you know, some people are desperately suffering from mental anguish. But God wants us in this hour to turn to him. And you know what? He's going to raise us up. He's going to put our feet on a rock. He's not going to let us wallow in sorrow. He's not going to let us go there. And you know, he's going to put a new song in our in our mouth. And that's going to that's going to impact people around us and our believers. Why are you so happy? Why are you like why why are you singing praises to your God? This is horrible. Look what's happening in our earth. But see, you're you're close to God. You waited patiently for him and he came. Now, here's the thing. I don't know what the time limit is on when God will come to you. And I don't know when he inclines his ear to me. Look in, um, and we're not going to turn there, but in Luke, I wrote the scripture down. In Luke, um, in Luke, well, I didn't write scripture down. I think it's Luke 10 or something like that. The woman with the issue of blood. She had that for fifth, 12 years. 12 years, she went to every doctor. She went everywhere. She tried everything. And then she heard about the Lord, and she went after him, and he healed her. And then there was another woman in chapter 13. 
She was bent over. She was crippled for 18 years. She was like that. 18 years. And she was in the synagogue, which made me realize she didn't give up on God. In her broken body, she still went. She still went to worship him. She had been waiting for 18 years for God to do something. And Jesus did. On the Sabbath, he touched her and made her well. Are you willing to wait 15 years? Are you willing to wait 18 years? You know, we live in a world right now where everything is instantaneous. We have microwaves. We have Instapots. We have everything at the touch of a finger. We complain when our computers are slow. And that always makes me laugh. Because when I was 10, there was no such thing as a computer. And when we had to do research, we had to go to the library. We had to get in a car and have someone drive us. We are so spoiled in this world. And if it's not instantaneous, we grumble. We get, we get mad. Look at people in the grocery lines. So, so what? You're waiting down a line in a warm building. What if you were in another country? And you were in line for one loaf of bread and it wrapped around a building and went far away. And it's possible when you get to the front of the line, they're out. You have a car full of food and you're just waiting to check out. Think of all the times we grumble because we have to wait. And really our waiting is incidental. 12 years, 18 years. Look at Sarah in the Old Testament. She waited for a child. And here's the, the interesting thing, too, and we have to be careful. Sarah took matters in her own hand. God does not want us to do that. He wants us to wait on him. He wants us to wait on him until we hear his voice telling us what to do. Sarah took matters in her own hands, and it became a disaster. She, Her husband had a son with one of the servants, and it became the enemy of of her son that she finally had. And look at Jacob, he waited how long to finally get his wife? Think of all the people, Hannah, think of all the people in the Bible that waited, 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 and waited. And we complain, and we complain because we're waiting in our homes. We're trying to be safe during COVID. And we better be safe during COVID because we don't want to get sick and we don't want to spread the virus. And this, I believe, is God's way of making it possible for us to draw near to him. I want to end with a list of um, scriptures on waiting on the Lord. You can copy down the verse, but um, don't turn to it. There are too many. This one's out of Genesis 49. Verse 18, I wait for your salvation, O Lord. Out of Psalms 27, verse 13 to 14, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Psalm 31, verse 24, Be strong. And let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. Let your heart take courage if you're waiting right now for the Lord. Psalm 33, verse 20. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Psalm 37, verses 7, verse 7. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Psalm 38 verse 15. Lord, I wait for you. You will answer, Lord my God. That's incredible. I love that one. I will wait for you. I will wait for you. And you will answer, Lord my God. Again, it's a two-part promise, isn't it? What you do, then he will do. I have waited with hope for you to save me, O Lord. I have carried out your commandments. Psalm 119, verse 166. 
Notice a lot of them are in the Psalms that we've been studying. Psalm 130, verse 5. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And his word I and in his word I put my hope. Not gonna hope in this, not gonna hope in that. I'm hoping in the Lord, his word. Psalm uh, Proverbs 20, 22. Do not say, I'll pay you back for this wrong. Wait for the Lord and he will avenge you. Isaiah 30, 18. So the Lord must wait for you to come to him so he can show you his love and compassion. Isn't that interesting? So the Lord must wait for you to come to him so he can show you his love and compassion. For the Lord is a faithful God. Blessed are those who wait for his help. And this is, I think everybody knows this one. It's probably one of our all-time favorites. Isaiah 40, verse 31. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Wow. Isaiah 64, verse 4. For since the world began, no ear has heard and no eye has seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. Um, I just, there's two more. I, I'll read them, but I, I hope that you're getting it. I hope that I get it. I hope we all get it. We're so, uh, so fractured right now. And when we look at what's wrong in the world, we get discouraged. We get disappointed. But when we look at God, we get lifted up onto that rock. So we need to wait on him and look to his face that shines like the sun. We need to hope in him. We need to always hope in him. Um, and let's see, what do I have left here? Um, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. I think I'm going to end with that. And again, as a reminder to all of us, Jesus waited on his father. He waited till his father said, go into your ministry. He waited for his father to say, it's time for you to give up your life. He waited on his father for in the be from between the time he was born until the time he died. There was a season for everything Jesus did. We need to look at this season. We need to, to look at this season as an opportunity to get close to God. We need to, you know, uh, just like there's that scripture, God turns everything into good. Um, it is hard right now. It's hard, but it could be a time God wants to get close to us and we get close to him. So thinking of the blood, thinking of the bread, make sure you have your elements. We're going to partake right now. Jesus, I, I am overcome by your love. I'm overcome by your, your, um, your patience with us, Lord. I'm overcome by your seasons, Lord, and how we know we go through different seasons, Lord, but you are always with us. You do not abandon us, Lord. I pray that today and every day, Lord, we become a little stronger in you, Lord, that we do rise up on eagles' wings and soar. Lord, may we be those that soar in the heavenlies, Lord. Lord, if we grumble, please stop our voices, Lord, and help us praise your name no matter what is going on. Thank you for your body. Thank you, dear Jesus.
in the blood. I always say it every week, there's life in the blood. Lord Jesus, thank you for shedding your blood for us. Thank you for that horrible death you suffered to set us free. Thank you, dear God, for being with us every step of the way. Lord, help us to incline our ears to you so that you would incline your ear to us, dear God. I pray, Lord Jesus, in this hour, make us stronger through your blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, now I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Oz. I have no idea um, his exact message, although it'll probably be on the Psalms. We don't really talk what we're sharing. It's kind of more fun that way, I think. Okay. Have a good day, everyone. God bless you. We're going to continue with the prophetic significance of Psalms, Book 1. Uh, book 1 ends today. Book 1 runs from Psalm 1 through Psalm 41. And we're going to uh, pick up with Psalm 34 and go through 41. But let's, let's look at Psalm 41. Go to that one initially. I'm getting my translations set up here. Psalm 41. This is the Genesis book. It's also the book dominated by David's Psalms. There are only four Psalms of the entire 41 Psalms in book one that do not have a, the superscription that says David wrote them. And actually, one of those Psalms, Psalms 10, uh, which we will look at uh, briefly, is, is really probably a single psalm with Psalm 9, and there, there are, are reasons for believing that. So that leaves us with three non-Davidic psalms in book one, which would be Psalm number one, Psalm number two, and Psalm number 33. But I want to look at Psalm 41 here. Remember that the Genesis book is dealing with beginnings in the church, new beginnings in the church. We're, we're looking prophetically at what do we need in our direction from these 41 Psalms to help the church make the new beginning that it needs right now. We're also recognizing that because this book is dominated by Psalms by David, uh, David is the beginning of the real kingship of the Lord being manifested in the people of Israel in the, through the 12 tribes of Israel to establish the Lord's kingdom in the earth. Psalm 41 begins with the words, Jan already mentioned it, Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. The Lord protects him and keeps him alive. He is called blessed in the land. Now that's the same Hebrew word, asher, which means to be blessed by the Lord. And it's the beginning of Psalm 41. Psalm 1, the first Psalm of the book, and you can look at Psalm 1. Psalm 1 begins with the same word that Psalm 41 begins with. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. Now, you have here Psalm 1, not attributed to David, begins with the word blessed. Psalm 41, the final psalm of book 1, begins with the word blessed. Same Hebrew word, asher. And that serves as a, a bookends for this Genesis book of Psalms. And I, I would like to quote 
uh, from Rolf Jacobson's uh, commentary on the book of the Psalms. It's part of the New International Commentary on the Old Testament, known as N-I-C-O-T, the book of the Psalms. Jacobson is one of three authors. And this is what he says about Psalm 41, and he ties it in with Psalm 1. Psalm 41 is the final psalm of the first book of the Psalter. Two respects of the psalm call for comment in this regard. The first is the opening word, ashrei, or asher, translated happy. Uh, others include the translation blessed or good fortune to those. The editorial choice to place a psalm that begins with this term as the last psalm in book one creates a bookend effect since Psalm 1 begins with the same term. At the very least, the bookend effect serves to signal that Psalms 1 through 41 are a single coherent co collection. Book 1, the Genesis book, the, the Davidic book of Psalms. Risking slightly more, an interpreter can argue that the fact that the first and last Psalms of Book 1 begin with this term signals the entirety of Book 1 is to be prayed and studied as a means to living a blessed or fortunate life. How do we live a blessed or fortunate life? Well, let me insert at this point, Psalm 1 contrasts the righteous with the wicked. And what we said when we started book one of the Psalms, we said that Torah precedes Toda. Torah is law, the word of God the teachings of the Lord, the principles of the Lord. Toda is praise and worship. So we need to walk in righteousness in order to be able to truly worship and praise the Lord. And that's why Psalm 1 distinguishes between the righteous and the wicked. Now that's going to hold significance as we go through the Psalms that we look at today in book 1. Keep that in mind. Back to Jacobson, the second feature of this psalm that deserves comment is the closing verse of this psalm. And if, if you're back to uh, Psalm 41, if you're not, go there, back to Psalm 41. We saw how it began, blessed is the one, and this is how it ends, verse 13 of Psalm 41. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, amen and amen. Now that begins with the word blessed, but it begins with a different Hebrew word. That's the, the Hebrew word barakah. To bless the Lord is not the same as asheri, which is for us to be blessed. When we're blessed by the Lord, he makes us happy and fortunate and prosperous. But when we bless him, we don't need to call him to be those things. He already is those things. He blesses us with those things because we aren't those things. We bless him. We use a different Hebrew word. So this closing verse is actually the close of the entire book one. It's kind of like a summary statement for all 41 Psalms. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. Each of the five books of the Psalter ends with a doxology, a, a statement of praise to the Lord. The Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy book each end with a, a summary statement of those books. And by the way, you can write those down if you like. Psalm 41, 13 is the end of book one. Psalm 72, 18 and 19 is the end of book two. Psalm 89, verse 52, is the end of book three. Psalm 106, 48, is the end of book four. And Psalm 150, verse six, is the end of book five and the end of the entire Psalms. With the exception of Psalm 150, uh, these phrases, these doxological phrases, are generally not considered by scholars to be part of the Psalms they conclude but are considered editorial additions to these psalms. In other words, the, the, the individuals who put the entire 150 psalms together in this order, they added those verses. Um, these doxologies signal this, that as a whole, psalms is a book of praise. It's a book of worship. That's why its Hebrew name is Tehillim. That's Hebrew for psalms, which means praises. So book one of the Psalter 
and the Psalter as whole, the book of Psalms, is both a book of instruction in a godly way of life, righteousness versus wickedness, as well as a worship book, a book of praise. Now, there's something also interesting to see when you look at these 41 Psalms, 38 of which are specifically attributed to David. Book one of Psalms is dominated by Psalms of lament. It's David crying out in sorrow, in sadness, in grief, in pressure, in warfare, in hostility. There's inner hostilities. He deals with his own sin. There are external hostilities. He deals with difficult circumstances. He deals with his enemies. His enemies are both nations outside of Israel, and it's from within. Betrayal by brethren, brethren Israelites. So, so you have much lament in the first book, and that's teaching us as the church, if we are going to have a new beginning in the Lord, it will always go through the path of the cross. Lament has to do with sorrow. It has to do with suffering. Lament has to do with the difficulties and the struggles of life. But as the Psalms proceed, as we move through the second and fifth books, from Psalm 42 all the way through Psalm 150, praise, psalms of praise begin to increase. There still will be psalms of lament, but psalms of praise begin to increase. And the Psalter ends, those final psalms in the book of Psalms are all psalms of worship and praise. And so it's teaching us we move through lament on our way to praise, and what we find in the middle between lament and worship is a lot of prayer. Psalms has to do a lot with prayer. So if we look at that threefold pattern, suffering, prayer, and worship, this is how God establishes his eschatological purposes in the earth. We are going through suffering right now. We need to press through that suffering by prayer and into praise, into worship. And what the Psalms promise us is the Lord is faithful and the faithful God will bring us into the fulfillment of his kingdom purposes. So Psalm 1 sets in motion this idea of the righteous and the wicked. Let's go to Psalm 9 and Psalm 10. Now we said that Psalm 10 does not have a title to it as if it's by David or anyone else. It's one of the four Psalms. But there are reasons why Psalm 9 and Psalm 10 are considered a single Psalm. In fact, if you look in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, that's why if, if you look into the Greek uh, version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, Psalm 9 and 10 are a single Psalm. And that's where we kind of get out of order with the Psalms. If you're looking at it in the Greek Old Testament translation, you're, you're kind of like saying, where, where the heck is Psalm 10? Why is Psalm 10 in this Greek translation, Psalm 11 in the, the Hebrew translation? Well, that's because 9 and 10 were a single psalm, and there's, there's a reason for it. Psalm 9 and 10 form an acrostic. We've talked about this before. Psalm 119 is the ultimate acrostic psalm in Scripture. An acrostic is where every verse or every other verse begins with the same letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And what, what, what a full acrostic is in Psalm, uh, one of the Psalms that we're looking at in our group today, Psalm 37 is a full acrostic Psalm. The first lines begin with the Hebrew letter Aleph, the second set of lines Bet, the third set of lines Gimel, that's R-A-B-C, and it goes all the way from Aleph to Tau. 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet 22 segments, each beginning with the same line, and that's Hebrew poetry. English poetry rhymes at the end. Uh, that's one way we do poetry. Hebrew poetry ha has this acrostic dimension, and see Psalm 9 and 10. Psalm 9 begins with the letter Aleph, and Psalm 10 ends with the letter Tau. So that's why we see that it is a a, specifically a, a psalm, a single psalm, a psalm of David. Now, I want to point this out about the four psalms that, uh, in this case, do not have David's title, and one of them obviously is the title of David. 
but we want to see there's a there's a special pattern here. If 37 Psalms are attributed to David and four aren't, those four that aren't give us this overarching theology, this overarching perspective to view book number one, to view the Genesis book, to view how God begins his work or his new work among his people. So Psalm 1 contrasts the righteous and the wicked, and it emphasizes the blessedness of the righteous. Psalm 2 is not attributed to David. Psalm 2 talks about God's Messiah, God's King, God's anointed. So the key to God working out his eschatological purposes in the earth is righteousness versus wickedness. Our becoming the righteousness of the Lord are becoming the righteous ones of the Lord. The second Psalm emphasizes it's only through the Lord's Messiah, through the Lord's King. It's not just these, these principles, these abstract principles or these characteristics of righteousness and wickedness that the Lord's purposes are established. The Lord's purposes are established through the Messiah, through his anointed one. And his anointed one in Psalm 2 says, gives us the nations as our inheritance. Let us keep that in mind. As I heard a brother say last week, I'm praying Psalm number two all the time in light of the things that are going on in our nation, the political issues, the economic issues, the health issues, the, the, the division in the church issues, the election issues. I'm praying Psalm number two because the Lord says he will use his son and we are to kiss the son for him to establish his kingdom purposes in the earth. Psalm 10 then would be a third psalm that isn't listed according to something David wrote, but we're going to we're going to look at it from the standpoint that it's tied together with Psalm 9. Now here's an interesting thing. Psalm 9, look at the superscription to the choir master according to Muth Laban a psalm of David, and Muth Laban says, the death of a son. That's what it means in Hebrew. What, what death of the son are we talking to? Well, some might think immediately of how when David sinned with Bathsheba, Bathsheba was uh, became pregnant. She's another man's wife. David has to cover this up. He tries to cover it up to make her husband think that this is her child, her husband won't sleep with her because he's one of David's mighty warriors. So David has to have him put to death uh, so that Bathsheba can be David's wife with David's child. Well, obviously the Lord is not pleased with both of those since that child dies, the death of a son, Muth Laban. It's the death of a false union. It's the death of a, fall, of a, of a son produced out of sin. But, the, but there's, a, there's, there's, there's prophetic implications for the death of a son. The death of a son has to do with the false son of God as opposed to the true son of God. This whole issue we're talking about, this, what is key to prophetic issues in this hour is understanding the real Jesus from the false Jesus. Understanding true discipleship versus false discipleship. See, Paul talked about another Jesus, a different Jesus that tried to, to get a hold of the Corinthian church. Paul said he preached the true Jesus, the real Jesus. We have to understand that that's the battle between false teaching, false prophecy, and the teaching of the word of God and legitimate prophecy. There is a battle, there is a war between not only a false Jesus and the true Jesus, but between what that Jesus produces. The true Jesus produces a true son. The false Jesus produces a false son. We have to purge, the church needs to be purged of the false Jesus, false prophecy, false teaching, which only breeds fear, confusion, misunderstanding, division, ignorance, and the true Jesus who releases the kingdom purposes of God. The false son is produced from listening to a false Jesus. Now here's what's very interesting about Psalm 9 and 10. Two figures emerge. Now in Psalm 1, it's righteousness 
versus wickedness. Those are character traits. In this psalm, you see in the Hebrew, the righteous one, that is the righteous person, versus the wicked one, the wicked person. The false son is what is produced by the false Jesus, which is produced by the wicked one. The, this this eschatological individual that begins to emerge in Psalms 9 and 10, that becomes the counterpart in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Don't have to turn there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is where Paul talks about what the church often calls the Antichrist. And you know what he calls the Antichrist? The wicked one. The lawless one. The one who opposes the Lord the one who exalts himself above the Lord and acts as if he is the Lord. Do you think that's a significant issue for us right now? In the church, it is. Do you think it's a significant issue that's emerging in this book one of the Psalms, which teaches the church about true beginnings, new beginnings, and false beginnings, and how the Lord overthrows false beginnings? It is through the embracing of God's righteousness and not wickedness, through the embracing of God's Son, the Messiah, that's Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, and through the understanding of we need to discern who the wicked one is and who the righteous one is in this hour, we begin to see and we begin to understand God's eschatological purposes, the way God does things in the earth. To the death of the Son. And we'll just look, we'll look at a few verses in, in, in Psalm 9 and 10. Now remember, there, there are verses that refer to the righteous as a group and to the wicked as a group. That's what Psalm 1 is. Righteous, the righteous are the group of righteous people. The wicked are the group of unrighteous people, wicked people. But there's this term, the wicked one. It's dealing with a single individual who births the group of wickedness versus the righteous one who births the group of righteous ones. Now, may we say we already know who the righteous one is. He's called that in the New Testament on numerous occasions. Jesus is the righteous one. So eschatologically, when the Psalms speak of the righteous one, they're speaking of Jesus. When the psalm speaks of the wicked one, they're speaking of the one in 2 Thessalonians who opposes the Lord. So let's, let's look at these references in Psalm 9. Psalm 9 verse 5 says, You have rebuked the nations. Now this is, the Lord is king. And the Lord has rebuked the nations. His son, the righteous one, rebukes the nations. You have rebuked the nations. You have made the wicked one perish. See, the wicked one all all of a sudden, they've been talking about the wicked as a group up to this point in the Psalms. But at this point, David prophetically speaks of the wicked one. You have rebuked the nations. You have made the wicked one perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The wicked one is a singular, produces wicked ones, produces a whole group of wicked whose names will be blotted out. Psalm 9 verse 16 says, The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. The wicked one is snared in the work of his own hands. So the wicked one the Lord is going to oppose, the wicked one ultimately... see. Uh, Pastor Bruce Todd said many years ago, gave me an axiom, never forgotten. The devil overplays his hand. And see, the devil in overplaying his hand ends up being trapped in his own snares. Wicked Wickedness will defeat itself. There's something inherent in wickedness that will defeat itself. The Lord will defeat wickedness. Wickedness will de- defeat itself. The church needn't get all freaked out about what's going on right now. Getting freaked out 
is part of the subversion of God's plan. We'll, we'll see that later in some other Psalms. Now, the wicked one uh, stops here, ceases in, in Psalm 9, and then Psalm 10 begins this way. Why, O Lord, do you stand afar off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked one hotly pursues the poor. Now, the wicked one is back back in, at center stage in Psalm 10 in this acrostic structure, so you understand both Psalms are talking about the same thing. It's talking about the wicked one. And it's interesting, it doesn't only say, in arrogance, the wicked one hotly pursues the group of people known the poor, but in arrogance, the wicked one hotly pursues the poor one, the needy one, the broken one. And so now you have two categories. Not only are you going to have the righteous one versus the wicked one, but you're going to see the one that the wicked one pursues. The wicked one goes after the poor. If you want to get a clear discernment of things that motivate the wicked one, it is people in power going after the poor and the vulnerable. That's a clear sign, the wicked one. That spirit of lawlessness is at work within people. For the wicked one boasts of the desires of his soul and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. The wicked one is driven by his own soulish desires, and he ultimately ends up cursing and renouncing the Lord. We drop down to verse 13, and we see, Why does the wicked one renounce God and say in his heart, You will not call me to account? The wicked one is not accountable to anyone and not accountable to the Lord. But you do see, Lord, for you know mischief and vexation that you may take it into your hands. To you, the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. And there's this contrast. And it really runs through all the Psalms and it runs through the prophetic writings and it's there in the Torah as well. That how the poor, the vulnerable, the oppressed are treated or mistreated is a signal between what constitutes the life of the righteous one, the spirit of the righteous one, and the life and spirit of the wicked one. Verse 15, break the arms of the wicked one, the evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed. And then it closes so that the man who is of the earth, the wicked one, may strike terror no more. The righteous one is the Lord first and foremost, and there is this consistent theme throughout scripture. You want to judge politicians. You want to judge political parties and their agendas. You want to judge leaders. You want to judge fathers and mothers. You want to judge employers and, and, and companies. You want to judge authority figures. This is how we judge them. Is there care for the oppressed, righteousness, deliverance, or is there oppression? Keep that in mind. Now, now let's 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 go then to where we left off last week to Psalm 34. Actually, uh, I should I should stop at 33 on the way to 34. 33 is the other psalm not titled by David. So Psalm 1 not titled by David. It's righteousness versus wickedness. Psalm 2, it's the Son of God, the Messiah, the Anointed One. This is, these show us how God's eschatological purposes are established. Psalm 9 and 10 speak of, that's Psalm 10, not, not titled by David, even though it's a singular psalm. Psalm 10 speaks of the Lord identifying the wicked one as a principle that hinders the 
his eschatological kingdom from being manifested, that fights against, that wars against, that works against God's kingdom being established in the earth. And it is abusive power, unrighteousness, ungodliness, people being oppressed. So Psalm 33, and we mentioned it last week, also does not, also does not, it's not title. And we said the thing about Psalm 33 is it brings in another element, the fourth element in terms of how God establishes his eschatological purposes. And that is three times in this psalm, his chesed, his steadfast love. 33.5, the Lord loves righteousness, justice, and the earth is full of the chesed, the steadfast love of the Lord. The steadfast love of the Lord is how he establishes his kingdom. We are to be righteous and to forsake wickedness as the people of God. We are to look to God's king. We are to learn to discern between the righteous one and the wicked one. We need to really understand what wickedness is. And I, I, I think much of the church has a wrong idea about what wickedness is. Wickedness has to do with abuse of power the removal of justice and righteousness from the earth through the abuse of power. We need to see that. We need to understand that. And the fourth dimension here of the overarching view of how God establishes his kingdom purposes in the earth, his steadfast love, his grace, his faithfulness to us, his commitment to us, if we don't have his commitment to us, how will we discern between the righteous and the wicked? If we don't have his commitment to us, how will we live out righteousness and eschew, forsake wickedness? And the, the source of his steadfast love is going to be his son. That's Psalm number two, the king, the anointed one, the Messiah. Verse five mentions his steadfast love. Verse 18 Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on, whose, on those who hope in his steadfast love, those who wait on his steadfast love, those who trust in his steadfast love. Pastor Jan talked about waiting on the Lord. Waiting, trusting, hoping, three related words and concepts in the New Testament. We have to hope on his steadfast love that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. And finally, verse 22, let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. So hoping in his steadfast love, those are the four ways that God is gonna establish his kingdom in the earth. Now, we pick up with Psalm 34. Psalm 34, notice how it begins, of David, when he changed his behavior, when he transformed his behavior before Abimelech, so that he drove him out and he went out. Uh, David, in Psalm 34, and here's an interesting, Psalm 34 is another acrostic. It, ac when you have an acrostic psalm, the order in the psalm is already established by the fact that it, it, you're, the first two letters are of the letter A. The, the, I mean, the first two lines are letter A. The next two lines begin with letter B. The next two lines begin with letter C, so to speak, in the Hebrew. There's already an order, and it says God, what it's saying is prophetically, the Lord has established an order in the earth that's apart from the way we view things or the way we live things out or the way we set things out or the way we think things should be. Acrostic Psalms always say God has an order and he will use that order to accomplish whatever the purpose of that psalm is. What's happening here with David? David, this is a reference to 1 Samuel 21, uh, but it's also a reference to Genesis 20 and Genesis 26. It, it references the life of Abraham and Isaac, as well as referencing David's life. David was called to be the king. It was prophesied by Samuel he'd be the king. Hey, you got a problem. Saul's the king right now. So again, we have a transition of power going on between David and Saul in Israel. And that transitions of power destabilize everything. Spoiler alert, America, but 
It's already happened. It happens all the time. And the thing is, is David was the legitimate heir to the kingship. Saul was the king. He was a le legitimately the king chosen by the Lord, but he was disqualified. And of course, Saul goes after David. And what you have to understand is David has this word from the Lord. He knows he's God's king, uh, but Saul's the king and Saul's going after him. And nothing David does. David was Saul's son-in-law. David sang psalms to deliver Saul from mental oppression, demonic oppression. David was a good son. David David delivered uh, Israel from Goliath for Saul and for Israel. I mean, David's done nothing but to prove that he's a legitimate supporter of Saul and a son of Saul. But once Saul finds out David's going to be the king, Saul's out to get him. And nothing David does has worked at this point. David is, is beyond desperation. David's been faithful to Saul. David's married to Saul's daughter. That's his father-in-law. I mean, David, uh, even while Saul is pursuing him, David will deliver a city of the, of the Israelites from, from Israel's enemies, and the city will go tell Saul, oh, David's here. David's being pursued, hunted down. David is at wit's ends. You know that he's at his wit's ends because he turns to the enemies of God's people. It's He's driven to violate his conscience like Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He's, that's just a, a Bonhoeffer reference for, for those of you who want to think this one through. Although people are thinking it through and I don't think they're getting it right. I don't think they're understanding Bonhoeffer correctly, but that's okay. Bonhoeffer said in Nazi Germany, no matter what he did, he was going to end up violating his conscience. Well, David's in a place, no matter what he does, he's backed into Ukraine. He is beyond desperate right now. And he actually turns to the Philistine king, who's the enemy, who's the enemy of the Jews, who David himself, David killed their champion, Goliath, and he turns to the king of the Philistines, who isn't named Abimelech, he's Akish, but this says, uh, this, this references Akish, and when, when David goes to the Philistine king and says, look, nobody, nobody's harboring me. I'm, I'm, the, I'm a fugitive. Will you please harbor me? I mean, can you imagine the desperation that would drive David to this? So David is in this incredibly desperate place right now. And in this desperate place, he turns to the enemies of all of God's people, but he's not called Akish, he's called Abimelech because Abimelech was like the title of, like it was a title that all the kings, all the kings of the Philistines were the Abimelech, just like all the leaders of, of Egypt are called Pharaoh. But the reason, the reason he's titled Abimelech because it not only helps us to understand what the Lord is trying to communicate us through the, the trials, the fear, the stark fear of David to, to, ha to be driven to do this. But remember both Abraham and Isaac in Genesis 20 and 26, they lie to Abimelech. They sin in the presence of Abimelech. They lie because they're so afraid. So what this is telling us is this is an acrostic psalm. This is an acrostic psalm. God has an order when we are driven to our ultimate fear. And here's the order. Saul, the first verse is, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. You know what magnify means? Make God great. Now, we don't make God great any greater than he is. We can't make it. It's make God great in your own heart. Make God great in your own mind. In the face of stark, raving petrifying fear, which so many believers are experiencing right now from all the things that are befalling us. You got to make God great. See, this is be lifted up you gates and be lifted up you everlasting doors. We have to increase the greatness of God in our heart and in our mind. I sought the Lord. He answered me and delivered me from all 
my fears. Those who look to him, the Lord, are radiant. Their faces shall never be ashamed. We reflect the glory of the Lord when we make him great, and then he transforms our faces to be radiant as he did with Moses when Moses saw him up on the mountain. And then it says, the poor man cried, and the Lord healed him and saved him out of all his troubles. And then there's only two places in all the Psalms, and it's in chapter 34 and chapter 35. The angel of the Lord is mentioned. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Now, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is Jesus. What David is saying is, when he was so afraid in this situation with Achish, the Philistine king, and what he did was he feigns madness. When the king starts saying, wait a second, you're my enemy, David starts acting crazy. He starts, he, he pretends that he's gone insane and he, he spit runs down his beard and he's acting like a lunatic and, and, and acting crazy. And the Philistine king just says, get rid of this guy. He's, he's just, he's a, he's a lunatic. He's not some, some, some great mighty warrior who, who defeats the Philistines. Well, David's feigning madness. It's a Hebrew word that's related to praise. Same word. So it's saying, don't feign madness, praise the Lord. See, there's a contrast. And the other thing uh, in, in the superscription talks about not only did David feign madness, but David came out of his senses. And the Hebrew word to come out of your senses, to act crazy, is related to the next verse, verse 8 where it says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Taste the Lord to see that he's good is, the, is related to the word to be out of your senses. So instead of feigning madness and be out of, be out of, being out of our senses, don't let circumstances, don't let fear do that to you. Instead, worship the Lord and taste the Lord. And what tasting the Lord really is, Tasting the Lord has to do with the fact that there was a there was a memorial feast. There was a thanksgiving feast. There was a thanks offering. One of the offerings of uh, the, the Hebrews. And it was the one offering that part of the offering was burnt and the rest of the offering was shared as a communal meal with brothers and sisters. That's It's the only offering, the, the, the thanksgiving offering, where... You not only offered thanks to the Lord, you gave a portion of the sacrifice to the Lord, but then you shared the rest of it with your brothers and sisters. And while they were eating that meal, you got up and bore witness and gave testimony to the mighty things that the Lord has done. All of these things are going to be significant to other verses and other Psalms in this group if we, we get to them on time. But verse 7 is important because it is in verse 7. In verse 7, the angel of the Lord is sent to deliver David. David is in a place of, shall we say, greater fear than he's ever experienced in his life. The greatest episode of fear that he's ever faced. And the Lord says, okay, when you're in greatest fear, I will send my greatest warrior to you. I'll send the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord is Jesus in the Old Testament. And it's only in Psalm 34 and Psalm 35 that we see the angel of the Lord come. So in this, in our, in our moment of greatest fear, let's cry out, send the angel of the Lord. I was reading this Psalm, of course, last week. And as I began to discover the relationship between 34 and 35, I started praying, Lord, send the angel of the Lord to Joel and Lauren's house. Lord, send the angel of the Lord to Edna Edwards' house, Lord. Lord, send the angel of the Lord to Emmy and Jay and Jackie. Lord, send the angel of the Lord to Amber and Chris Brace. Lord, send the angel of the Lord to Alex Ribeiro, Lord. Lord, send the angel of the Lord to Joyce Underwood's house and her family. And I just began praying it because we need to see the angel of the Lord. Now look how the psalm ends. The psalm ends, verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. 
Evil itself will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. We are, we're going to keep seeing the wicked and the righteous. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. Thank you, Lord. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. And that also has, that leads us into the next Psalm because it ends with this idea of being condemned. And being condemned means being found guilty in a trial, a legal trial. Actually, you know, in a civil case or a criminal case, you're found guilty. That's what it's talking about. And that leads us right into Psalm 35 because it starts out with the words, contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. The Hebrew word is riv, riv. And that means a legal court dispute. Now, now we're talking about, when we're talking about contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me, we could be talking about an actual legal situation or we could be referring to something that takes place in the heavenly courtroom. Keep your hand in Psalm 35 and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I want you to see this is exactly what Paul was referring to in his own life situation. Now, in 1 Corinthians and in 2 Corinthians, Paul's the apostle that founded the Corinthian church. He founded them and these other so-called apostles who, by the way, followed a different Jesus. They came in. They came in to Corinth and tried to subvert Paul's apostolic authority. They put Paul on trial. None of those who take refuge in the Lord will be condemned as guilty and then contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight in the legal courtroom and vindicate me, Lord. 1 Corinthians 4, Paul says in the first verse, he's, he's being attacked, just as David was being attacked. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Paul needs to be found. Leaders in the body of Christ need to be found faithful. I don't care what they teach. They need to teach and live. They need to be found faithful. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. See, Paul was on trial just as David was on trial, just as many of us are on trial. That runs all through these Psalms in book one. Paul is, I mean, David is constantly saying, people are putting me on trial. They're questioning me. They're questioning my motives. They're questioning whether I hear from God. They're questioning my life. They're questioning my understanding of the word. They're questioning my integrity. They're questioning me. But Paul says, you guys can judge me, but that's not where ultimate judgment comes from. In fact, I don't even judge myself. Now, this is important to understand. We don't judge ourselves, meaning we neither pronounce ourselves guilty, but we don't pronounce ourselves innocent either. See, there's this idea in the body of Christ, I'm not guilty because I have the righteousness of Jesus. That is correct. That's absolutely biblically correct. But that has to lead us to a kind of lifestyle that supports that. I don't walk around saying I'm guilty, but neither do I walk around saying I'm innocent. I have to go in the courtroom of the Lord and hear his verdict innocent or his verdict guilty. He says, I don't even judge myself. I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. Just because I'm not aware that there are sources of deception, sources of sin in my own life, doesn't mean that I'm acquitted. Well, I'm not aware of anything wrong in my life right now. Well, so what? <laughs> Your brothers and sisters are aware. The Lord is aware because you're not aware. That's not what acquits you. But there is a proper form of acquittal. And it has to do with that Hebrew word, reeve. It means to enter in to a legal pronouncement in the courtroom of the Lord where the Lord declares guilty or innocent. I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time until the Lord comes. See, the Lord's coming. We're not talking about the second coming here. We're talking about, let me, let me give you a practical explanation. I wake up every day. Here's my prayer. Lord, 
Show me where I'm deceived today. Lord, show me where I'm not seeing things clearly today. Lord, show me where there perhaps is sin at work in my life. And show me, Lord, where there's powerful righteousness birthed in you and your spirit in my life. I pray those things every day. Every day for me, I start my day entering into the courtroom of the Lord. I want to hear from God. I need to hear from God. That doesn't mean we don't need to hear from each other, but we need to hear from God. This is the point that David and Paul are making here. Do not pronounce judgment before the time till the Lord comes. See, this is why I say we need a fresh new revelation of the Lord. And a fresh new revelation of the Lord is we come into the throne room of his judgment and we hear his pronouncement. See, that's what it means. That's the difference between true and false prophets that Jeremiah 23 talks about. Jeremiah 23 talks about true and false prophets. And it says, true prophets stand in the counsel of the Lord. C-O-U-N-S-E-L, the cabinet of the Lord, the judgment room of the Lord, the place where the Lord renders his verdicts, the place where the Lord writes his judicial proclamations. That's what a true prophet is. False prophets, they don't stand in the counsel of the Lord. They follow the opinions of their own hearts. So the Lord has to come. We need, we need to be praying, Jesus, come to me today in a special way, a fresh way, a new way, a powerful way. What I saw yesterday is not good enough. I need to see you today in a new, fresh, powerful way. And when the Lord comes, he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation, his appraisal from God. Back to Psalm 35. David is crying out for an appraisal. He's saying, Psalm 35, 1, Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. There's we, a lot of accusations. And accusations are not just from other human beings or other worldviews. There are accusations in our mind that come from the devil, that come from powers and principalities, that come from our past. There's Our foes can be Many, many kinds of foes. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. Draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. David wants to be acquitted. And then not only is that word utilized, uh, not only is that word utilized in that point, Psalm 35, verse 1, this, this term, reeve, then there is, it's also used later on in the psalm. Let's, let's continue. Let's, uh, let's go to uh, verse 17. How long, O Lord, will you look on? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. I will thank you in the great congregation. In the mighty throng, I will praise you. Let not those rejoice over me who are wrongfully my foes, and let not those who wink the eye, who hate me without a cause, for they do not speak peace. They don't speak shalom. Now, this is the contention that's coming against David and Paul. They don't speak peace, but they are against those who seek peace in the land. Take a look at America right now. Look for the people that are seeking peace peace in the land. And watch for those who speak against those who are speaking for peace in the land. You have a picture of the righteous and the wicked emerging. There are peaceful people who desire peace. These are the ones the Lord supports. They are against those who are seeking peace in the land. They devise words of deceit. They open their mouths against me. They say, aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. The spirit of the accuser is behind them. You have seen, O Lord, be not silent. O Lord, be not far from me. Awake and rouse yourself for my justice, for my cause, my God and my Lord, for my riva, that you enter into this heavenly lawsuit with me and speak, vindicate me, bring forth my justice, bring forth my righteousness 
in the midst of this. Let them not say in our hearts, aha, our heart's desire. Let them not say we've swallowed him up. Let them be put to shame and disappointed altogether who rejoice at my calamity. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who magnify themselves against me. Let those who delight in my righteousness shout for joy and be glad and say evermore, great is the Lord who delights in the shalom of his servant, to bless his servant. Then my tongue shall tell of your righteousness and your praise all the day long. See, this is what the Lord does when we enter into his courtroom situation. When we enter into the courtroom of the Lord, what we do is we cry out for God's righteousness. Now, when when David is using righteousness in verse 27, let those who delight in my righteousness, he's speaking, he's going back to verse 17 when the Lord says, rescue me from their destruction, and verse 18, and I will thank you in the great congregation, in the mighty throng I will praise you. Understand how the Lord's righteousness works. Jesus dies for us. The Lord imparts his righteousness to us based on Jesus. But that's not the first step. That's step number two. Step number one, righteousness from the Lord is first where God delivers his people from their enemies. The first manifestation of God's righteousness is he delivers his people from their enemies. If God doesn't deliver his people from their enemies, God's righteousness cannot be imputed and imparted to us. New Testament theology uh, oftentimes has started justification by faith with Jesus died and imputes God's righteousness, that righteousness to us. That's the second step. The first step is God delivers his people from his enemies. And on that basis, he says, you're righteous. We are righteous because the Lord delivers us. And after he delivers us, we recognize it's his righteousness is our righteousness. But there's a third dimension. Some people call it sanctification. It's all a singular process of God working out his righteousness. What is David saying? If you deliver me, I'll sing your praises in the great congregation. If you deliver me and make me righteous, I'll go out and deliver others in the same way. That's sanctification. Sanctification is when we busy ourselves with delivering others with the same deliverance that the Lord delivers us. This is biblical righteousness. We must be about doing more than studying our belly buttons and saying, I'm righteous by the blood of Jesus. We are. But because we're righteous, he's delivered us. Now he wants to make those he's delivered in the deliverers. So David is saying, make me a deliverer, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Psalm 36. Now I have a problem here and I need my wife I, if she's watching this. I don't have t uh, I don't have a clock here with me. I need my my um, phone, which is plugged in uh, over on the sink. I need that to be able to follow time here. I'm completely lost time. Psalm 36. We're back to the wicked one. Transgression speaks to the wicked one deep in his heart. We're back to the wicked one now. And see, it's the wicked one who seeks to hinder the eschatological purposes of the Lord. It's the wicked one. We're back to Psalm 9 and 10, the wicked one. The wicked one seeks, the wicked one seeks to hinder the purposes of the Lord. He seeks to stop God's deliverance, God's judgment, God's justice, God's rescue of the poor, God's steadfast love. And we need to be aware of who the wicked one is. Thank you, dear. Okay, we got a few more minutes here. Transgression speaks to the wicked one deep in his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes. The wicked one does not fear God. He is not accountable to God. He flatters himself in his own eyes. That's self-deception. Wicked one flatters himself. The wicked one doesn't come into the throne room of God's judgment. The wicked one justifies himself constantly. Do you know of anybody who 
is never wrong. Do you know of anybody who constantly justifies himself at the expense of everyone else? That is the spirit of lawlessness that is at work in the spirit of Antichrist. There is no fear of God before his eyes, and when there is no fear of God, he flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity, his sin, cannot be found out and hated. See, we need to find out our sin, we need to hate our sin, but self-deception is the veil at work in people's lives that keep them from hating their sin, from even discovering their sin. The words of his mouth are trouble and deceit. He has ceased to act wisely and do good. He plots trouble while on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not reject evil. So the wicked one is obsessed with seeing his own purposes and his own devices fulfilled. And so he blinds himself to any kind of personal fault or sin. He does not reject evil. It's contrasted. Verse five, your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. There's a heavenly solution to come against the spirit of lawlessness at work in people's lives, at work in the nation, at work in the church, at work in the earth. That is a, a lawless spirit according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I reference it again. Please read 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 10. We'll, we'll, we'll cover it specifically at a future time, but read it. This is what we're talking about. That's this lawless, wicked spirit that is at work in the earth to deceive people. But there's a heavenly answer. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Faithfulness is God is faithful to us based on his truth. It could say, your steadfast love extends to the heaven, your truth to the clouds. God's truth goes together with his steadfast love. Grace and truth are the glory of Jesus. And his grace frees us to embrace his truth. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your justice like the great deep. So we have steadfast love, truth, God's delivering power, God's justice. Verse seven, again, how precious is your steadfast love, O God. We're gonna see three times again, chesed, his steadfast love. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. The shadow of his wings. We come into the holy of holies. There are the cherubim surrounding the glory of the Lord. And we come in there and it is in his steadfast love we find refuge. They feast on the fatness of your house. There's abundance in the house of the Lord. And you give them to drink from the river of your delight, the river of your pleasure. God's river of life, the abundance of God's table, they're set before us. We eat and drink to full satiation. <laughs> For with you, Lord, is the fountain of life. See, this is Psalm 36 is saying God gives us the fountain of life as the wicked, the wicked ones over here plotting against God's purposes being realized in history and God is bringing his people into the fountain of life. Let's go there. But here's something interesting. With you is the fountain of life, the source of all life. In your light, we see light. See, God's life brings light. See, God's life brings revelation to us, the true source of revelation for us. The true source of revelation for us is God's life. When, when we partake of the tree of life and forsake the tree of knowledge of good and evil, when we partake of the tree of life, we are transformed. We begin to think like God thinks. We begin to feel like God feels. We begin to will like God wills. We begin to desire like God desires. We begin to do like God does. We can be Jesus saying, as Jan also referenced it, I only do what I see my father doing. This is what it means, the fountain of life. God's life becomes the distinction in our inner being between wickedness and righteousness, between truth and falsehood between God's covenant loyalty and unbelief because of justice as opposed to oppression. 
Let the foot of the arrogant, let not the foot of the arrogant come upon me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the evildoers lie fallen. They are thrust down, unable to rise. Now we only have a few minutes. I can't really go through these next Psalms, but let me tell you, let me give you um, a summary of 37. Psalm 37 is another acrostic. So it's this beautiful order of God. And it, it, what dominates it is the righteous one versus the wicked one. So when you read it to yourself, look for all the references to the wicked. We're talking normally about the wicked one and look for the, the things that refer to the righteous one. Now also righteousness and wickedness as groups of people are, are, are mentioned in that psalm as well. It's hard if you don't have a, a, a Hebrew to look to see whether it's the righteous one and wicked one singular, or it's those who are righteous and those who are wicked. But what the, the idea of the psalm is, is the righteous one, Jesus, produces righteous ones. The wicked one produces wicked ones, a group of the wicked. And that's what Psalm 37 says. But, but here's one thing I'll look at. Um, one, two, three, four, five times it mentions the inheritance of the Lord. The inheritance of the Lord is righteousness. And here, here are the five ways of righteousness in Psalm 37. Psalm 37 verse nine says, for evil doers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Remember, we're talking about getting our inheritance here the church becoming a church that walks in its full inheritance in the Lord. Here's the first way we get it, those who wait on the Lord. Jan talked about that today. Verse 11, the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. The meek shall inherit the earth. That's one of the uh, uh, Beatitudes. The meek shall inherit the earth comes from this psalm. Meek are those people who are so broken who are so shattered, become pliable and submissive to the Lord and trust in him. We obtain our inheritance by waiting on the Lord, by allowing the Lord to break us so that we are yielded to him. And notice verse 12, just, just to give you an idea, verse 12, the wicked one plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. Um, Verse 13, but the Lord laughs at the wicked one for he sees that his day is coming. This wicked one is contrasted, is contrasted with the ones who are meek, who inherit the earth. All right, so we got wait on the Lord, be yielded to the Lord. Verse 22 says, for those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land. We need to allow God to bless us. That's how we get the inheritance. Verse 29, for the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. We need to walk in his righteousness. We need to allow him to work his deliverance for us. Verse 34, finally, wait on the Lord and keep his way and he will exalt you to inherit that. He will lift you up into the heavenly places. That's how we inherit the land. But there's another word that occurs three times in Psalm 37. And this is what we cannot do in this hour. Psalm 37, verse one. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. We're not to fret. Verse seven, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Verse eight, refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it only tends to evil. We're not to fret. Fret means an anxiety that drives us because of grief or fear. There's a lot of fear, there's a lot of grief going on. I don't care who you believed needed to win the election, should have won the election. If you fret over who won it or didn't win it, you're going to get out of this mode where you can inherit what God wants you to inherit. We've got to stop fretting. We've got to stop fretting right now. Psalm 38, Psalm 39 are both about unanswered prayer. 
It's do not forsake me, O Lord. Don't rebuke me, Psalm 38, 1. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. And it, it's, it's a penitential psalm. It just, it deals with, it deals with David's repentance of his sin. And it deals with the heavy hand of the Lord on David. And David ends Psalm 38 with unanswered prayer. He's crying out, God, move, please. And Psalm 38, 21 ends this way. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, of my salvation. But there's no answer. And that's why he starts up Psalm 39 with the same thing. He talks about unanswered prayer in his life. He closes the psalm. He actually says, I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle as long as the wicked one is in my presence. Sometimes, do you understand Jesus was silent in front of his accusers in the Sanhedrin until the Lord released him to speak. See, sometimes we get in trouble with our mouths. We're fighting for our own righteousness with our mouths instead of just, Lord, put a muzzle on my mouth because I'm in the presence of the wicked ones. When, when, when people are dominated by wickedness, sometimes it's better to keep your mouth shut than to speak it. But any rate, not enough time to go through 38 and 39 as I would like to. But 38 ends an unanswered prayer. 39 ends with an unanswered prayer. Verse 12, hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace. Don't be silent at my tears, for I am an, an, an alien with you. I'm a, a, a resident homeless person like all my fathers. Look away from me that I may smile again before I depart and I am no more. Psalm 38 and 39 are long stretches of unanswered prayer. See, when the wicked one is coming against us, there may be long stretches of unanswered prayer, but we keep pressing in. Remember, lament, pray, praise. Lament, pray, and praise. Psalm 40 then starts out, finally, there's an answer. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction. Out of the miry bog, out of the, the, the moist clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. The Lord will ultimately give us a new song. And remember, a new song is about the Lord doing a new thing in our lives. And that leads us to Psalm 41. Blessed, blessed, just like Psalm 1 started. So in conclusion, we need to press into the Lord through lament, suffering, through prayer, which will ultimately give us a new song of praise and worship, and the blessings of the Lord will come to pass. Brethren, the blessings of the Lord are going to come to pass. I don't know how long this is going to be. I don't know how difficult this is going to be. There will be lament. There will be suffering. There could be loss. But we must be those who wait for the Lord to deliver us in his righteousness, to impart his righteousness to us, to impute his righteousness to us, so that we can be deliverers for others. Thank you, Father, for this day. Move upon us, Lord. This, this is powerful. Your word is so powerful. You're giving us the pattern. We're, we're not just out there saying, oh, all these horrible, terrible, look at all these horrible, terrible things that are happening. We're giving people strategies and solutions from your word. We, I mean, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and Hopefully, he's bringing Mike Osminski and others into that circle, but God will deliver his people. God will be faithful. God will allow his steadfast love to prevail. Grant it to us, Lord. 
in the name of Jesus. Joyce Underwood just said, stop fighting to be right. Stay humble before the Lord. Amen. We'll close it with that. God bless you, brethren. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.